time. Justice and Justices of the Constitutional Court. The focus of this matter is Article 13B of the Convention, more particularly whether there was and or is a grave risk that Emily's return to the UK, which in this matter means into the care of Mr. Ball, would expose her to psychological harm or otherwise place her in an intolerable situation. The application of Article 13b in convention matters has been the subject matter of scrutiny by academics and courts nationally and internationally since the inception of the convention. In this regard, this court in Sonderup versus Tondeli in 2001 concluded that the provisions of the convention did not conflict with our constitution because of inter alia, the defenses that existed. The court held that the limitation that there was in regard to the short-term interests of children possibly being compromised in order to return to the state of habitual residence was mitigated by the fact that there were defenses, which meant that if a child's rights were going to be compromised to a more serious extent, that a child's return would not be ordered. And the, 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 uh, the question of custody would be dealt with by the court in which the child uh, was at the time. Although there were, of course, constitution, uh, there were, of course, Hague cases prior to 2012, in the decision of KG versus CB, a Supreme Court of Appeal decision and the judgment of Ms. Justice van Heerden, she dealt with in detail Article 13b defenses. And both in regard to the existence of Article 13b defenses and the application of Article 13b defenses, she expressed the view that the correct approach, which she then set out in her judgment, was that of the court in Re E, which was a Supreme Court decision in 2011 in England. And in Re E also followed in Re D in England, the 2006 case of the House of Lords. This set out the manner in which a Hague, a 13B defense should be applied in Hague matters. And in Re E it was stated that there was no need for an Article 13 1B defense to be narrowly construed. And this was because the very terms of Article 13 1B had a restricted application. They said that the words of Article 13 are quite plain and need no further elaboration or gloss. Since KG versus CB, this has been the manner in which Article 13 1B has been applied in convention matters in South Africa. And the application of that 13 1B test has been consistent with the ongoing manner in which it has been applied in national, in international courts. It was also the test that was followed by the Supreme Court of Appeal in this matter. We say that it is apparent from the applicant's arguments on the merits that their complaint in, the reg in regard to the judgment of the SCA is the application by the SCA of an established test to these particular facts. When considering the matter before it, both the Western Cape High Court and the SCA recognized, one, that convention matters are jurisdictional in nature. In other words, that it presupposes that it is in a child's interests to be returned to the state of habitual residence for that state to make any determination in regard to custody issues. While that is, of course, recognized as being the general position, the, our courts and international courts have recognized that that is not always the case. 
In regard to Article 13b defences, both the Western Cape High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal recognised that the court looks to the future. And this is, what, as was set out in the G and D case, the 2020 English case of the family court. One looks at the situation that the child will face upon return. And that is what the court did. It looked at the situation that the child would face in the event that she, Emily, was returned to the United Kingdom. There was also recognition that a Hague Convention matter is not a custody determination. This is apparent from the fact that there is a parental rights application pending in the Western Cape High Court. As matters stand, the respondent does not have any parental rights in respect of Emily, and the applic second applicant does. It will be for the court in the Western Cape High Court to make a determination as to what is in the long-term best interest of Emily on the basis that the Supreme Court of Appeals judgment stands. So it is a question of which court will then determine Emily's longer term best interests. And we say that the Supreme Court of Appeal has not made a determination in regard to Emily's long term best interest. It's made a determination that it would not be in her interest to be returned to the UK for any further proceedings to be determined because there is a grave risk of her being placed in a situation which would be intolerable for her. In regard to the question as raised by the applicants of a balance of short-term and long-term interest, we say again that the, the Western Cape High Court and the SCA addressed this, and in particular, the SCA recognized the fact that in terms of short-term interests, one looks at whether or not undertakings or safe harbor orders may ameliorate the harm that to which a child may be exposed. Because indeed, if such undertakings or safe harbor orders can be made, then it is recognized that a child may be protected pending the court in the other country, the country of habitual residence, making a final determination. Importantly in respect of this is the recognition by our courts, our courts and international courts, that in the normal course, a return order means that a child will be disrupted to some extent. However, what is envisaged in terms of Article 13.1b is that it is not the normal rough and tumble that a child will face, rather that the harm that the child will face, the risk of serious harm that the child will face is something which that child in those circumstances should not be required to tolerate. Importantly, and the overseas cases talk about ameliorating the harm, can a safe harbor order be granted which will ameliorate the harm? And importantly, such safe harbor orders are not always contingent on what a central authority in the other country or social services may or may not do. It can be contained in the return order that, for example, a father will provide accommodation and maintenance for a mother and child pending the outcome of a determination, and that would be what was required to keep the child safe pending that hearing. In KG versus CB, Van Heerden spoke of children being insulated against harm. So there should not be any harm which they suffer. If, they are, if one cannot insulate them from that harm, which is of a serious nature, then they should not be returned. And of course, I emphasize again that that doesn't mean that it is the end of the matter. It means that the requested state 
will then determine the question of custody in a separate hearing and will look at many other factors regarding the long-term interests of the child. The difference between the two judgments of the Western Cape High Court and the SCA is as follows. We say that the difference was in the application of the same test, which does not require any revision to the facts of the case. Where there was a difference, we say, is that the Supreme Court of Appeal applied Plascon Evans. And in finding Plascon Evans, in applying it as it should have, it found that on the evidence of the late mother, Professor Berg, as well as that of Mr. Bohr, that there was a grave risk to Emily that being returned would place her in a situation where, which would be an intolerable situation for her and that no undertakings would be able to ameliorate that harm, let alone insulate her from that harm. Importantly, and in regard to the report of Professor Berg, both of her reports must be read in context and one cannot take isolated sentences from it to try and find a different meaning. We say, had it been the view of Professor Berg that Emily could have been returned to the United Kingdom, which in this case meant into the care of her father, and had she been able to forge an attachment with him, then she would not have said that the consequences for Emily being returned to the United Kingdom would be dire. Secondly, when she spoke about an ability for Emily to be able to forge an attachment to her father, there are two critical elements which must be taken into account. The first is that she spoke of them being in the same jurisdiction, geographically close to each other where he would be able to exercise contact and build that attachment. Secondly, and as appears from her report, it was because at that time, Emily was in a phase of development in terms of attachment theory, where she was able to forge such attachments. In addition to that, and if one looks at Professor Berg's report, as has been quoted by the Supreme Court of Appeal, but if we go to, in particular, her second report, which is at page 174 of volume two of the record. And this was when Professor Berg was asked, in the event that Mr. Bull did have a secure bond or secure, there was an attachment prior to coming to South Africa in September 2019, Will that impact on whether or not she will suffer harm being returned to the United Kingdom? And what Professor Berg says is that it might be less severe for her. Doesn't say it will be, it says it might be. But she follows that up by saying, however, even with this possible scenario, which is not supported by what is stated in the report at my disposal, and then she deals with the fact of how a child at that age and at that stage of development forms attachments and concludes that it is unlikely that that, would, that that would in fact take place. Secondly, and in regard to bereavement counseling and therapy, of course, Professor Berg says that bereavement counseling and therapeutic input would help. However, she states that it cannot in and of itself make up for the loss of the mother and the relationships which she has formed, and that therapy cannot counter the trauma induced by the losses she would have endured. It is the equivalent of putting a small plaster on an open wound. This is a particularly acute wound as it could have been prevented. So we are talking about a situation which she describes as dire in the event that Emily is to be returned to the United Kingdom. And that evidence, which was before the Western Cape High Court, the Supreme Court of Appeals said in applying the test to those facts, that 
it would constitute an intolerable situation for Emily and that there is not any intervention or therapy or undertakings which will ameliorate that. And, and the, the view similar to that of the respondents was that this was not a reflection of the services that would be rendered, but a reflection of the seriousness of the situation in which Emily found herself. At that time, when her mother was still alive, but where she was going to lose her mother. So the Supreme Court of Appeal considered the evidence that was before the Western Cape High Court, and then in addition, also considered the report of Ms. Pettigrew, which was new evidence, which was, and was a report in regard to the circumstances of the child and the well-being of the child subsequent to the loss of the mother. And contrary to what was submitted on behalf of the applicants, we say that these experts can of course, given their expertise, which is uncontroverted and their views are uncontroverted, indicate what the risks are. They do not say she will be harmed. They do not say she will commit suicide. They do not say she will have a psychotic breakdown. They say there is a significant risk of that. And that is the test. 13B doesn't say there must be a guarantee that harm is going to happen. They say there must be a grave risk that the child will be placed in that intolerable situation. We say that that situation persists to date, that Emily remains in a position where a return order to a parent who she does not know, to a country that she does not know, would place her in an intolerable situation and that therapy is not going to address the risk and the harm which she will face as a consequence of that. Consequently, we say that this court's jurisdiction is not engaged. Firstly, there is no constitutional issue raised. We say that section 28.2 in and of itself is not sufficient to engage this court's jurisdiction. Indeed, if it was, it would open the floodgates for many, many matters to come to this court. There is also no suggestion that there needs to be the further development of the law or the tests in terms of the constitution. And we say that this well-established test, which is recognized internationally, does not require further, uh, further development. It is consistent with the framework of our constitution and the provisions of section 28.2. In regard to section 1673b2 of the constitution, we say there is no arguable point of law of general public importance such that it ought to be considered by this court. We say the application of Article 13b test by both the Western Cape High Court and the SCA was the same, and in keeping with the decision of this court in, in Sondra versus Tondeli, with Supreme Court of Appeal decisions and foreign courts. The application of an established test to a particular facts is not a question of law as has been held by this court. In regard to it being of general public importance, the facts of this matter are so unique that we say it cannot possibly be of general public importance. In the case that has been referred to and heard by the SCA and LC versus DC in 2022, the very question of a, a parent who had wrongfully removed a child, then relying on her conduct as part of a defense arose. It's been dealt with before that there are no cases which deal with a parent dying. But we say this does not mean that it's of general public importance, in fact, quite the contrary. In regard to the interests of justice, such that the matter should be heard by or considered by this court, we say that there are not reasonable prospects of success. On the facts of this case, and we say that the Supreme Court of Appeal indeed looked at Mr. Ball's evidence as contained in his affidavits and weighed it up against that of the respondents as well as that of the, of the experts. On the facts, on the uncontroverted views of the experts and given the affliction of time in this matter, that there cannot be any prospects of success 
and for a return order of Emily to be made. So we say, Justices, that this established test deals with the, all the points that have been raised by the applicants and that they do not require any, that the test does not require any further elucidation by this court. We say the answer to the questions raised by the applicants are not reasonably necessary to determine the outcome of this matter. To clarify one or two points that were raised, in regard to the position of Ms. Koch, she stated on affidavit in the, in the uh, Hague papers that she would accompany, if necessary, Emily back to the United Kingdom. In other words, she would fly back with her if that was what is required. She stated, however, that she was not in a position because of her employment to stay on for any period of time in the United Kingdom, nor was she in a position to litigate in an English court. The fact that she did not set out chapter and verse of her income and her means, we say is irrelevant. The cost of litigation should be accepted as being clearly more in the United Kingdom if you are earning rands than, than if you are in the UK earning pounds, and that a normal lay litigant is not usually in a position to be able to litigate in these courts, let alone overseas courts. Indeed, she's been put to great expense as a lay litigant having to come to go to the Supreme Court of Appeal and now come to this court, whereas Mr. Ball is being funded by the state um, courtesy of the central authority. And of course, she is the only person who is maintaining Emily financially. So to criticize the person who is the only person maintaining Emily financially at this point, because she has not put, put out chapter and verse of her ability to litigate is with respect unfair on her. And it cannot be suggested that this court should make an order that Emily be returned to the United Kingdom based on it being then implied that Ms. Koch, who is not the mother or the parent, should also return with her, live in the United Kingdom and fund litigation in the United Kingdom uh, until such time as a determination is made in that court. The fact that she would be able to bring an application for care or contact in that court certainly does not suggest that this court or any South African court should direct her in essence to do so. I'm not sure whether we, whether I need to address this court on the legal representatives uh, report, um, given that the applicants appear not to have uh, read it. Uh, we, I had asked my clerks to pass a message to all counsel during the break, but maybe it did not reach you. I had said that uh, we would uh, allow you to only submit uh, written, uh, supplementary written submissions, which would deal with the report after um, uh, the applicants have submitted theirs, uh, so that you, both of you would only deal with that report by way of written submissions and not in oral argument. Thank you, Chief Justice. I have to confess, I didn't look at my emails during the break, so it might well be there and I hadn't looked at it. Oh, okay, all right. I think Ms. Mayosi also acknowledges that she understands. Okay, all yes. right. You, you are left with, with uh, five minutes, or with six minutes. Thank you. Chief Justice and Justice. You are not compelled to exhaust your, <laughs> your 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware of that. Just one last point, and, and in regard to the affliction of time, it is of course not Emily's fault that there has been this affliction of time, but the reality is that she was two and a few months, she came to South Africa in sept September 2019. She has experienced enormous loss. Unfortunately, the second applicant, what Mr. Ball, 
has yeah. had little contact with her and she is now two months shy of her sixth birthday. And we say that that has to be a factor which this court takes into account when one considers whether or not at this stage it could ever be in her interests within the context of the convention to be returned to the United Kingdom. And um, one of the justices, I think it was Justice Mishlanga, referred to the G versus D decision, which although it was the minority decision, raised the question. Uh, you mean Justice Madanga? Was Madanga. it Justice Madanga? I apologize. You raised the question of the effluxion of time and that the, suggesting that sending a child back after that effluxion of time would most certainly, it, it militates against uh, what the, the purpose of the convention, convention is and would not be a prompt return that would be uh, meet the best the, the interests of a child principle underpinning the convention. Uh, Chief Justice, Justices, I have no further submissions to make to you. Thank you very much. Uh, isn't the position that the longer it takes for the father to be with the child, uh, the more difficult it becomes for it to be said that it's, it's uh, in the interest of the child that uh, the child return to the country where the father is. Chief Justice, certainly there, there is of course an element of that and there is an element of that in, in all convention matters where there are appeal procedures uh, even were Ms. Uh, were, were Claire, the mother, still to be alive, um, they would nonetheless, and, and if she was, for example, saying, well, I can't go back for whatever reason, the afflaction of time with appeal procedures impacts on all convention matters, not only matters of this nature where the parent has, has passed away, but because we say that the parental rights application is yet to be considered, that the outcome of that application, and I, I, I speak in, in regard to generalizations, it cannot possibly be anticipated, and it's certainly not our anticipation, that the father would not continue to have parental rights and responsibilities in respect of the child. And it is of course anticipated and hoped, of course in the event that the child remains in South Africa pending that determination, that the child would build a relationship with the father in due course. That is going to depend very much on the steps also that the father takes to build a relationship with his daughter. Well, but the fact remains, uh, he's trying to build that relationship from thousands of kilometers away. That, that and is so. that, And as each year passes, is he not going to be facing an even more difficult, difficult hurdle to ever get his child back. Let me say, let me say to you, speaking for myself, uh, subject to whatever uh, arguments are made and looking at everything, on the face of it, it would seem to me that the ideal situation is for a child to grow up in the presence of both parents. 
that's the ideal situation. And that the next situation is that if one of the parents has passed on, the child should grow uh, uh, in the presence of the surviving parent unless there are cogent reasons why they should not be so. You Chief probably Judge. will say, you probably will say there are cogent reasons. Uh, uh, before you, you, you answer, uh, I, I have not uh, seen uh, uh, anything that the father is said to have done that I think would really, should really bar him from living with a child. That is if just one looks at at, 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 at him and his conduct. Of course, there, there were complaints about um, abuse of alcohol. The, uh, there was a complaint that there was an incident when she he allegedly neglected her uh, next to a pool. And um, there were complaints about um, uh, mental, uh, his mental health. Uh, but as I understand the position, it, it doesn't appear that any of that is relied upon unless I've missed something to deny him. Uh, it, it, it looks like it's more the, the fact that moving her from the environment in which she is now and her aunt uh, should be commended for the love she shows to the child and all the support and so on. But it seems to seems that the, the 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 issue is that moving her from where she is and putting her in a new environment. Uh, uh, and the new environment being in, in, in the UK would cause the risk that is said to be grave to have the consequences that we're talking about. Uh, so if that, as, if that understanding is correct on my part, it just seems that uh, here is a father who would like to be with his child, who, of course, is not without uh, weakness because we all have our weaknesses. Um, but none of that seems to be something paramount that uh, the SA seems to have relied upon in terms of his own conduct. Uh, to deny him. Uh, so I, I, I'm concerned about a father who allows uh, the mother of the child to take the child to another country on the understanding that they are going to come back. And then when the mother is in the other country. Of course, she was uh, uh, sick, uh, changes her mind about coming back with the child and says, well, no, I want the child to remain here. That has not been agreed. The father is 
thousands of kilometers away. But six years later, he doesn't have the child back. And uh, it looks like to me, as the time goes on, he's going to be, he's going to find it even more difficult to persuade courts that the child should go to him. So you have a situation where it's your biological child and uh, you might have had some mistakes or weaknesses here and there, but nothing that is regarded as serious as to bar you from having the child back and your child is growing away in another country and all you are restricted to is uh, Zoom uh, contacts. Uh, of course, I take it he can he can travel to South Africa, but uh, it's 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 a situation where I'm just thinking that um, it looks like the longer uh, the matter remains unresolved, the more difficult it's going to be for this remaining parent to be with his child. Oh, yes. Thank you, Chief Justice. If I could try to, try to answer that um, as, as briefly as possible. Firstly, for all children, it is of course an ideal to be raised by both parents. Certainly parents uh, would like to raise their child. If there is only one parent, then ideally for a child, they should be raised by that parent. We know that that is not always in the child's best interests, even where a parent may want that. A parent may want very earnestly as a surviving parent to raise their child, and yet it may not be in the child's interests, which is a tragedy for that parent and to a certain extent for the child, but as we know, the child's best interests are going to be paramount. I would suggest, Chief Justice, that the, the concern that is raised in regard to the father is a, is a concern which is, of course, understandable, number one, but which is the concern which is the domain of the court that makes the decision in regard to the long-term parental rights and responsibilities in respect of the child. And we agree that the longer that it takes to get to the pending Western Cape High Court uh, application, the more difficult it is going to be for, I would, rather, I, I would certainly for Mr. Ball to persuade a court that Emily should return to the UK with him, but the affliction of time is going to make it more difficult for him to build the relationship with the child. However, as far as the, 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 the facts before the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Western Cape High Court, it was not a weighing up of should the child stay in the care of the aunt or should she be placed in the care of the father? It was a question of, does a return of the child in terms of the convention, pending some or other inquiry or determination in regard to the long-term best interests of the child in the United Kingdom, does that return place the child in circumstances where there is a grave risk of psychological harm. And we say that inquiry involves the child and only the child. It doesn't inquire into whether his drug use, his psychological problems, his alcohol use are of such a nature that he can or cannot look after the child. At that point, it is, is there going to be a grave risk of psychological harm to the child? And the basis of that grave risk 
was that the child would be removed from South Africa, having suffered significant loss and placed in the care of a father who she didn't know at that age and in a country, in a home, in a village that she couldn't remember. And that the impact would have been very serious for her psychologically, both in the short and long term. And very importantly, Chief Justice, both in the report of, Ms. of Professor Berg and Ms. Pettigrew, they talk about the very negative impact that that could have had on Emily's relationship with her father if she had been returned at that juncture because he would have been a stranger to her and because she would not, she would have had a distrust that which is the normal thing that would happen to a child that age placed in that position. So a placement of her in her father's care at that juncture could actually have done far more damage to her relationship with him than this time that it is taken and is taking before we get to the, the parental rights and responsibilities application. But again, the respondents in this case sought to place further information before the Supreme Court of Appeal in regard to Emily's circumstances, given that Ms. Kalane had passed away. From the time of the hearing in October 2020, we do not know anything about the circumstances of the father of his ability to care for the child, of whether or not he's employed, whether or not he has any issues, doesn't have any issues. We have, there is no information. And all that we know in regard to contact is the information as at the date of the Supreme Court of Appeal hearing. And then as is uh, contained in the McGarrick affidavit, where it says that there was a subsequent visit by Mr. Ball in 2022 to, to visit Emily. So his contribution, his effort to have contact with his daughter, his circumstances are entirely unknown at this juncture. So a return on the basis that Emily should be placed in the care of her father, who's got faults but doesn't seem to be precluded from parenting, it's based on information which is um, some th almost three years out of date. I, I don't know if that answers your, your question. Uh, yeah, well, um, if the, at this stage, do, do, do you know how far the litigation is in relation to uh, the final rights and responsibilities of parents? How, do you know how far that litigation is? Chief Justice, um, and a, we filed a uh, founding affidavit and an opposing affidavit. They were filed in, in 2020. So I would think that there would have to be um, investigations into, into the circumstances of the child as well as the father and reports placed before the court and updated affidavits. But it's, it's not set down, obviously, because mm. we wait for the outcome. But mm. um, I'm asking Judge President is, is very amenable to us, assisting us with expedited dates. And there's certainly yeah. no doubt that expedited dates could be obtained to facilitate as speedy a hearing as possible of that yeah. application. Yeah. Well, if, if, if that uh, matter, once judgment has been handed down in that matter, if there are going to be appeals, which will end up in this court, as this one has, you, the parties may probably be looking at quite a few years before that issue is finalized. So it, I don't know how long, but it looks like quite a few years. Chief Justice, certainly appeals could take some time. Mm. If one, if one is, if I'm speculating, and I, I say this because this was raised in the Supreme, it was raised in our, in the Supreme Court of Appeal and was addressed, is that even if the Cape High Court 
considered it to be in Emily's interests to be placed in the care of her father. I would suggest that it is unlikely to be something which would happen overnight. That there would be a process of her getting to know him and becoming familiar with him and building a relationship with him. So pending the outcome of any appeals, I would suggest that it is likely that there will be orders in regard to the contact which he will be able to have with his daughter in order to build that relationship and that that order would of course have to stand um, pending the outcome of any appeals that may or may not be brought so that it would be a very different situation where during the course of the appeals, hopefully uh, Mr. Ball will have um, made an effort to have more regular contact with his daughter and build a relationship with her, despite mm. the, uh, the geographical uh, difference. Yes. Um, no, th 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 thank you very much. But is, is, is my understanding that the basis on which the Supreme Court of Appeal made the order that it made, or the decision that it made, um, correct that it was not so much because of anything that the father has done wrong. Correct, Chief Justice. They do raise the queries, and that was the second leg of the Article 13b de defense of the respondents in the court of quo. The first leg was that returning her and placing her in the situation where she was with although her biological father, in, for all intents and purposes, a stranger in a strange country surroundings. That was the first leg. The second leg that we did raise was that we queried the circumstances of the father to parent her and the circumstances to which she would return, given both the concerns of uh, Ms. Kalane, as well as concerns that had been raised by social welfare. So that was the second leg. And the Supreme Court of Appeal in its judgment referred to those and referred to the circumstances of the father having some question marks. But we submit that it is clear from the, from the, from the, the, the judgment that it was in regard to the risk of harm that she would face being placed in the care of what was, for all intents and purposes, a stranger in a strange place having experienced a significant loss by the death of her mother. And at that stage, where there would then be, a, again, the loss of her second maternal attachment and the significant impact that it would have on her. Yes, no, thank you. Uh, when you do, and I mentioned this uh, for both your benefit and Ms. Myosi's benefit, when you do address uh, to us supplementary written submissions on uh, Ms. Carsten's report. One of the things I would like both of you to uh, say something about is this. When you read that report, you will see that it looks like uh, Emily very quickly got used to a stranger. Miss Cousins, so much that I think it may be, it may have been on the first day that she had visited and spent time with with her and uh, her aunt. That when she left, according to her report, uh, Emily, uh, w uh, I think, <laughs> went with her up to the gate or something and hugged her before saying goodbye. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, she may have so quickly got used to a stranger because of what she may have been told about the stranger. And therefore, it may be that if uh, she uh, gets to know positive things about her father, if and when they try and develop a relationship, she might well 
uh, be able to get used to her, to him quickly because as I say, with regard to Miss Customs, it looks like um, she got used to her, but that's something that I would like you to address uh, among other things in the supplementary reference submissions. Miss Cool, please. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions? Um, Ms. McCurdy, if I may, uh, just a couple of points on approach to Hague matters. The first is you say the SCA, unlike the High Court, um, applied the Plascon Evans rule, and you say it was correct to do so. Now, I know at the SCA level one has the Pinello judgment, which says that the Plascon Evans applies in Hague proceedings, but I'd like to get your submission as to whether assuming we reach that point, we should endorse it. The uh, Commonwealth decisions emphasize the summary nature of Hague proceedings. They are meant to be decided extremely promptly and very rarely is oral evidence um, heard. And the approach rather seems to be to make the assessment of grave risk by looking at the affidavit evidence to see how cogently it is advanced with what supporting corroboration and to make an assessment on the affidavits. Now, of course, we do have a certain measure of that in our court procedure in Rule 43 proceedings. One, a, a court is expected to some extent to make findings on probabilities or, or take into account things that might not even be probable, but may be reasonably possible. We can do that with Rule 43 proceedings. We can do it in uh, provisional liquidation and sequestration proceedings and interim interdicts. When one takes that into account and the fact that um, often one or more of the parties who whose evidence might be required will not be in the requesting state to give oral evidence, um, ought it not to be permissible for a court rather to make some assessment on the probabilities and on the, the, the reality of risks? As you have said, a risk doesn't need to be certain. Um, should we should we say in in a matter which concerns children and and abduction that it almost becomes a game of forfeits that if the respondent says something and is it so far fetched that it can be dismissed on the papers that rules the day is that a correct approach in Hague matters? Justice Rogers, when when you put it. In those terms, it of course appears not to be. I would I would suggest that there would be no reason for Plascon not to apply. But as does sorry, if I can just stop you, the, the 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 reason that it might the reason that there might be is that this a Hague case is not about parental rights and responsibilities. It's on a preliminary question as to which court, which jurisdiction should hear a case about rights and responsibilities. So in that sense, it's preliminary and summary. And I, I don't think it's unknown in our procedure that preliminary matters should be decided to some extent by assessing probabilities and cogency on paper. Certainly, and of course, I, I would suggest that And I, I'm, I'm aware that, that Flascon has been followed in Hague matters in, in, in many cases in our courts. Um, and it was certainly endorsed in a full bench decision in the Western Cape High Court in a, in a Hague, um, a Hague ap a, a appeal. I would suggest that employing PLASCON, even though there is, a, there is a summary nature to the proceedings, is indeed acceptable, but that if a court deviates from that because of the circumstances of the matter and the summary nature, and sets out why what the applicant is saying is preferred or what the respondent is saying is not preferred, that that would of course be permissible. 
but that they would that they even though there's a summary nature to the proceedings that there needs to be a substantiation of of why the evidence of one or the other is accepted in applying the 13b test to it so so evidently there must be proper reasoning um the indeed. only question is whether that sort of reasoning without the oral evidence is permissible i i gather from your answer and i appreciate it might have take you you might not specifically have prepared on this point but i understand your answer to be that you don't rule out the possibility that a court could um given the summary and urgent nature of these proceedings depart from plascon evans but should fully explain then why it doesn't apply plascon evans and, and why instead correct. it prefers to make some assessment on the affidavits that is correct justice rogers the, the, the second matter um arises from something you say in paragraphs 88 to 92 of your submissions about mootness this focuses on the fact that claire died shortly before judgment was given in the high court and you say that the aunt heidi is was not the let us say the um unlawfully retaining parent and technically therefore the matter was moot um i I'd, i'd like to know whether mootness is something you you actually uh, desire the courts to consider but i would like to i'd like your submission on this the application was brought against both claire and heidi presumably with the knowledge that by then those two respondents had decided that if the mother died as seemed to be likely sooner or later she should remain in south africa with heidi um the the hay convention is not about parenthood It doesn't mention the word parent anywhere it is simply about um somebody being abducted or unlawfully retained um so sh- surely the hay case was as good against heidi as it was against claire and to 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 say that it su- had somehow been rendered moot by the mother's death seems to me entirely artificial and not in keeping with the convention they were both in a sense retaining heidi i oh, was sorry retaining emily thank you justice rogers the reason that we say that is firstly uh the citation of heidi as second respondent in the court of quo was never explained in any detail it seems that it was a reaction to the parental rights and responsibilities application in which both claire and heidi were were applicants and so the convention application cited both interestingly in the section 18 application it was suggested that heidi was not a a party for the purposes of 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 that application but of course we know that that once you a party is cited as a party they're a party for all purposes why we say said that is because there was not one single allegation in the papers that there was any wrongful retention or that there would be any wrongful retention by heidi of emily and there was no suggestion by heidi that contrary to an order and in the absence obviously of any appeals that she would after claire's death retain emily in south africa in contravention of an order so that is why and, we say I, sorry if i can if i can jump in there presumably neither claire nor heidi would have said that they would have acted in contravention of the order uh, the the whole point of the proceedings was to get an order but whether a legal conclusion was drawn in the terms that you've now sketched which you say wasn't done surely the facts were perfectly clear and were in the founding papers that by the time this application was launched it was clear that um, the mother and the aunt had come to the view that emily's best interests would be served by emily staying with the aunt in south africa after the mother died that is and so that, that and and that the aunt was as much part of that decision as the mother and intended to act on it and we know she did act on it that is so justice rogers i think what is important to distinguish is that it was only at the time of the hearing and so so at the time that the convention application was launched and in the knowledge that the mother was terminal 
what was asked for was an immediate return. So it was that the mother was unlawfully retaining um, Emily in South Africa and that an immediate return of Emily must be made. So that was on, on the, an order which would have been that the mother is unlawfully retaining and the mother must return the child. So if the proceeding had been finalized in sufficient time. Indeed, indeed. And so we say that it, the, the aunt was in essence an add-on. There was no suggestion of her unlawfully retaining Emily in South Africa for as long as Claire was alive. All right. Um, I don't want to pursue this further, except now just to ask um, if, if mootness has to be dealt with, it has to be dealt with before we reach Article 13B or even jurisdiction. So um, it, it, is it your uh, submission that we should um, dispose of this on the basis of mootness if on, or, or do you not press that point? Justice Rogers, we don't press that point. We only raised it in response to the the, the question raised uh, or the, uh, the, the, what was raised by the applicants as being the SCA uh, making a, a final determination on custody. And we were saying, well, you know, had that been the case, that would have been way back in December 2020. Um, but we, we're, not, we're not pushing, pressing that point at all. All right, so that's Plascon Evans and Mutinous. The last point I just want to raise is one concerning costs. Um, I appreciate neither party is here to fight about costs orders, but of course, in the, at least in this court, we will need to decide what to do about costs. What struck me is that the High Court gave quite a careful reasoning as to why, despite the father's success and the central authority's success, it was going to direct that the parties pay their own costs. On appeal, the um, SCA gave no attention to costs and almost seemed to think that an adverse costs order should follow as of course, and it said that the costs would follow the result in both courts, including costs of two counsel. Now, that costs orders on the face of it against the father and against the central authority in both courts. Uh, I would like to have your submissions on the approach to costs orders in Hague matters. My limited reading of the Commonwealth Authority suggests that cost orders are not usually granted. Um, if one takes the central authority, the first applicant, uh, first, um, it is discharging, it is a public body uh, discharging a function under a convention, and it is a convention which says in Article 27 that the central authority in the requesting requested state need not act when it is manifest that the requirements of the convention are not fulfilled. So in a, in a manifestly bad case, the um, central authority is not expected to act or is not obliged to act. But in all other cases, surely it is the central authority's duty to place the matter before the court to say that there has been a wrongful retention. And if there is a defence, it is for the court to decide whether the defence is made good and then to determine in the court's discretion, not the central authority's discretion, whether a return order should be made or not. So why should it be the norm if it is? that the central authority pays costs. I, I, I'd rather get your submission on that first before I ask the, about the, the position of the father. Certainly. Uh, Justice Rogers, in the normal course, you, uh, you are quite correct that, that costs orders are not usually made. And most certainly when a return order is made, the, uh, the parent who's unlawfully removed or unlawfully retained the child, a cost order is not usually made against that parent. It is of course a, a difficult one to argue where one may say that the persistence by a central authority to oppose an appeal or to launch an appeal in another court whether or not that is necessarily 
as part of their duty and placing facts before a court and whether they should pursue them. So I think that they... At, at, at least in the SCA, the central authority was defending a judgment in its favour. It was defending a judgment in its favour, but it may well be that there are circumstances in which it should give consideration as to whether it does defend a judgment given in its favour, subject to circumstances and deflection of time. So I think that how it is, how costs are dealt with in a court of first instance may perhaps differ from how costs should be dealt with by an appeal court. I certainly don't suggest that a parent such as Mr. Ball should be multed in costs. And I would suggest that in any event that the costs order in the Supreme Court of Appeal, if it was, uh, if it stood, would not be met by uh, Mr. Ball, but would be met by the, by the central authority. It's a difficult one because one assumes that in these matters, parents are seeking to do what they believe to be in their children's best interests, and that the approach in regard to costs such as in the call and cases like that, would the, the same would apply. With the additional caveat, of course, that yes, these are convention matters, there is a different duty on, on the central authority. But it, there's also a difficult question, of course, where, for example, as is the case now, that there is then an appeal to the constitutional court and the person who is the only person who is financially maintaining the child is required to incur significant costs in coming to this court, uh, which she as a lay person is having to, to pay. And that in the event that she is successful in this court, um, that she nonetheless has to have incurred those costs. So it's, it, it is a very difficult one when one is weighing up central authority and their duty versus um, the burden on, on lay persons of having to incur legal costs in, in proceedings of, these na of this nature. Um, would I be accurately summarizing your submission then to say that at least insofar as the central authority is concerned, um, in Hague proceedings, there should not be automatic recourse to the usual position that cost follows the result, that one would examine the central authority's conduct. And would you accept that it would be a legitimate aspect of the costs consideration, that costs order should not be made in a way that might discourage a central authority from fulfilling its obligations under the convention? Certainly, that, that would of course be correct. And insofar as the father is concerned, I, I gather, I presume from a practical point of view, your clients don't intend to present their bill to the, to the father, but um, insofar as the SEA order has that effect, it is not one you rely on as against the father. Certainly not, certainly not, Justice Rogers. Not and in this, court, in this court, you don't seek costs against the father? Certainly not. And, and just finally, on the SCA costs order, I'm not, I, I suspect there isn't an independent appeal against the costs order, but it does appear to me that the, the SCA simply followed the usual rule. It doesn't appear to have considered the, the unique position that the central authority occupies in convention proceedings. It, it, would, it would seem not. I can only... Uh, convey, which I think it emerges from the, the judgment of Justice Gamble, that in that matter, it was conceded by the central authority in the section 18 application that costs should follow the outcome. And accordingly, the costs order was made, which was only pursued against the central authority and not against Mr. Ball. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank, thank you, Justice Rogers. Ms. Uh, Ms. If there are other questions, still the yes, Justice Theron. Thank you, Chief Justice. Ms. McCurdy, what 
What are your submissions to the suggestion that in these circumstances, the short-term best interests of the child should be limited in order to protect the integrity of the Hague Convention and the principle that in general, the best interests of the child are served by, reserve, by returning the child to the country of the habitual residence. Just to run the, the overall, the overarching uh, purpose of the convention is that a child's best interests are served by not being unlawfully removed or retained, and that the child should be returned to the country of habitual residence for the purposes of their care and contact arrangements being determined in that jurisdiction. However, it is recognized that where the short-term best interests of the child are going to be compromised beyond it merely being the rough and tumble of a move where it would be, for example, still with the mother, but a disruption in schooling, a disruption in environment, a new routine, that those are part of the rough and tumble of everyday life. Further, that where it may be slightly more than the rough and tumble of everyday life, that short-term interests can be um, compromised, for want of a better word, where undertakings or safe harbor orders will protect the child's interests in that short term. However, the, the, the very reason why there is an Article 13.1b defense is because the drafters of the convention and courts applying the 13.1b test recognize that there are circumstances where the short-term interests of the child are going to be compromised to such an extent that it would be intolerable for that child. In other words, that it would be way more than the rough and tumble of ordinary life. And as I think it was said in INRI D or INRI E, that it would be more than one could expect that child to have to tolerate in the circumstances. So, um, Justice Ron, of course, the, under, the, the underlying premise is exactly as, as you have stated. However, the very purpose of 13.1b is because it is recognized that it is not in every single situation that uh, the, the short-term best interests can be compromised be, uh, and, and that there are situations where, where an Article 13.1b defense does in fact exist, that then the discretion can be exercised not to return that child. Thank you, Ms. McKelly. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. I, Chief Justice, just one, one question from my side, please. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, Ms. McCurdy, picking up on the point raised by the Chief Justice with regard to the reflection of time, I, I want to just put to you the scenario that emerges from the papers. In, in 2020, Professor Berg, when asked the question about a transition from Heidi to Paul, that's the second applicant, Answer that question by saying that if they lived in the same city, either in the UK or in Cape Town, a transition would be possible. She said Emily would start visiting. She would, the, the frequencies of the visit would increase. She would form a bond with her father and the, the transition could take two to three months. That was the opinion then. And it would seem that the high court order followed shortly after that. Obviously, this is water under the bridge, but that transition could have been possible either if the father came to South Africa for a short period or if Heidi went to the UK for a short period. But certainly, it would appear to have been possible. I will fast forward to 2022. The report of Ms. Pettigrew now almost puts to rest any possibility of a transition. She says that, in particular, the time that Emily has spent with Heidi 
really makes a transition to her living with, with her father, something that would trigger the risk of psychosis. And so moving forward, it's almost that you don't need to look into a crystal ball to predict what the further effluxion of time is likely to have. How do we deal, how do we deal with that uh, in, in the context of what may have well been a, a viable proposal when it was made uh, in 2020? How do we deal with that now in the context of the A Convention and its imperatives? Justice Colopin, in interestingly, and this was dealt with in the report of, of Ms. Pettigrew, is that at the end of 2020, in December 2020, and for a three month period, Mr. Bull was in fact in South Africa. And certainly, and as appears from that report, the contact that took place did not result in uh, Emily forming a bond or relationship with Mr. Ball such that she was able to even spend very long periods of time with him. So as much as that was a, a predictor on the part of, of uh, uh, Professor Berg, it did not in fact take place, taking into account that, she, that, that Emily had at that point just lost her mother. So she was dealing with an, an absence of mother for want of a better word, because she, as I said in the report, she, she couldn't understand the, the concept of death. It was just an absence of mother. And then the introduction of, of Mr. Ball into her life over that period of time. So that did not in fact occur. In 2022, what the report of Ms. Pettigrew says is that, and, and it, I, I would suggest that there is not any indication that in future and subject to various things happening, that Emily might not develop a relationship with her father. What is stated by Ms. Pettigrew is that the time period for Emily to form attachments has now come and gone. And so she will not form an attachment to Mr. Ball. And the question of attachments versus relationships is dealt with in some detail in her report. In regards to what both you, Justice Colopin, and the Chief Justice have raised, this is, of course, a very sad case for a parent in Mr. Ball's position. However, the convention, although it does not, and one should not ignore the rights of parents, the convention and our constitution focus on the best interests of the child as being the primary consideration. And so if in due course, it is possible and is in the best interest of the child to reside with the father or to, expend, or to spend extended periods of time with him, there is the opportunity for this to take place. But it cannot be either as, as part of the convention application, whether in the court of quo or on appeal, nor can it be the focus of a parental rights and responsibilities application, the focus cannot be on the rights of the parent. It has to be on the rights of the child. And it, it, it would not be, sadly, the first time that it is not in the best interest of a child to be in the care of a biological parent. But we as respondents certainly do not suggest that Emily will not be able to build a relationship with her father and have the input of her father in her life. Whether it emerges in due course that she resides with him, that, that, that we don't know because we also don't know with respect what input and what effort Mr. Ball is going to make. The willingness of a parent or the want of a parent to care for a child is one thing. The work that a parent puts into a relationship with a child is very different. And that is something which the court dealing with the parental rights and responsibilities application will have to assess. Thank you, Ms. McCurdy. Thank you, Justice Colopin. Um, Chief Justice, if I might ask a question or two. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you may go ahead. Thank you. 
Ms. Uh, McCurdy, you have, in response to a question put to you by the Chief Justice, said that there was no information about the position of the father at the time that the matter was heard in the SCA. Now, if you look at what happened in the SCA, did that not amount to a rehearing of the matter? The court allowed new evidence to be presented, and should the court not have been more active in the manner in which it dealt with the matter, seeing that it considered or the matter engaged the best interest of the child? Was it not an abdication of its duty not to call for further information at that stage as to what the position of the father is and if there has been any change in his position since the matter was in the in the um, in the high court um, that it comes back basically to what was um, to some extent what was raised with you by Justice Rogers and that is the nature of these proceedings are they really adversarial in nature or should the court take a more active and uh, approach in the, in in the, in in dealing with with matters of of this nature. Uh, <clears throat> Justice Van Sale. Firstly, as the respondents, and and I wish to point out that the respondents brought an application to place a report from Ms. Pettigrew before the Supreme Court of Appeal in April 2021, before it even had obtained the report from Ms. Pettigrew. And we did that to, to, so as not to delay proceedings and was on the basis we are going to obtain a report, whatever is in that report we will place before, before the court. There was the opportunity for the applicants, had they wished to do so, the applicants in this application, to place further evidence before the court, or at least bring an application to place further evidence before the court. They elected not to, and the question of any report being obtained as a counter report to the report of Ms. Pettigrew, and I think it is dealt with in the judgment that they elected not to do so. Uh, from a time period and said that they didn't uh, that they, they didn't want there to be any any postponement. In respect of the the question which arises in regard to the father's circumstances, what we argued and and in, in in the the court of quo, and in the Supreme Court of Appeal and remains relevant today, is if Mr. Ball had been a a very good father on the papers with no history of any issues. But he did not have a relationship with Emily anymore, that she was not attached to him, that he was a stranger to her, and that she had no memory of England. The argument would have been the same. The argument of 13B defense was not on the basis of Mr. Ball the, the first leg of him being, for want of a better word, a bad father. The first leg of the argument was that there would be, that Emily would be placed in an intolerable situation because she would be picked up from South Africa and she would be placed in the care of a person who would be a stranger to her. The house that he was in at the time was not the home that she had lived in with her mother. She would have no memory of people who she knew in the United Kingdom. So even if there had been an updated report to say all is well with Mr. Ball, that would have been irrelevant to the first leg of the 13.1b defense and the one which the Supreme Court of Appeal found would in fact place Emily in an intolerable situation. Yes, the, the, the manner in which you which you deal with uh, with the question is is clearly on an adversarial basis, and that's and that's how the, the Supreme Court dealt with it as well. It inquired from the respondents in the appeal if they um, would um, 
would want to present any further evidence. They said no, and the court proceeded. But, but is that good enough? The court is dealing with what is in the best interest of the child, and the court should call for such evidence or information to be placed before it to make an informed decision. Justice Van Sale, we say that had the Supreme Court of Appeal called for evidence for a report in regard to Mr. Ball's circumstances, it would have been irrelevant to the question of whether or not Emily would face an intolerable situation upon a return because the intolerable situation that she would be facing would be a little girl of some three and a half years old being placed in the care of a stranger who, yes, would be her biological father, but that would mean nothing to her at that age in a home and in an environment which was entirely strange to her. So in our view, the Supreme Court of Appeal had the information which was required, which was in respect of the best interests of Emily and whether anything had changed in regard to her position, which would mean that a move into her father's care at that stage would not place her in an intolerable situation. It's, um, the other issue that I want to raise with you is, is the cogency aspect if we get that far and that is with regard to the evidence of Professor Burke and Ms. Pettigrew. It doesn't appear to me to be anything in their evidence that deals with the short or the long-term psychological effects on Emily for not having the opportunity to bond with her only surviving parent at this stage in her life. The second aspect that I found to be absent from the evidence of Ms. Pettigrew is that she raises the likelihood of Emily experiencing a psychosis, but nowhere in her evidence does she deal with the existence and the nature of any treatment that may reduce that risk. Um, you dealing here with expert witnesses, expert witnesses have a duty not only towards their client, but towards the court in order to allow the court to arrive at an informed and just decision. The failure to have dealt with these aspects, does that not detract from the value of the evidence of those two witnesses when we deal with the issue of cogency? It seems to me the focus was very much on the um, relationship which Emily has built with the aunt and the bond that she had formed and what the consequences, possible consequences would be if she is taken out of that environment. Thank you, Justice Vincel. In all matters where an expert is appointed, of course their duty is to the court. However, the experts are appointed with a specific mandate and to address certain queries and questions. So the mandate which is contained in the papers to Professor Berg was to comment on the impact on Emily should she be placed in the care of Mr. Ball in circumstances where and the time periods were set out of where she had been away from him. So, and, and she does address the fact that that period of time where Emily has not had him, had contact with him, impacts on the, on the fact that she would not then be able to form an attachment to him in terms of attachment theory and attachment versus a, a relationship. So I would say that in fairness to Professor Berg, she was not asked to comment on and to weigh up what are the effects going to be of a short-term separation or a long-term separation from Mr. Ball. The question that was posed to her was the impact on Emily 
in the event that a return order was made, given that a return order would mean that Emily was placed in the care of her father, and she then addressed the question, and and, and that which was which was what she was requested to do. Ms. Pettigrew addresses the question of that that therapy, Emily placed in therapy in the United Kingdom. And she says, even if it was with a very skilled therapist, it would be extremely difficult for that therapist to address the difficulties that Emily would be uh -huh. facing because having been placed in the care of Mr. Ball, who was a stranger, and then going into therapy with a therapist, it would be difficult going, going from essentially being in the care of someone who she did not have an attachment to and a trust relationship, and then being expected to be in a therapeutic relationship, which, which is a trust relationship. What she does speak about is the importance of therapeutic intervention where the child is, is having ther therapy and has got the, the base, the, the home base and the continuity of everything else in her life continuing the way that it is and that the effectiveness of therapy in those circumstances versus the effectiveness on, of, of therapy in circumstances where she is not seeing a therapist from a home base of, with, a, with a parental figure whom she trusts. Yes, thank you. Ms. McCurdy, can I ask, uh, is there any discretion exercised by the High Court uh, in reaching a decision? And if so, if the answer is yes, did the SCA approach the matter on the basis that the discretion exercise was not done judicially? And particularly if you if you look at the judgment, uh, I'm looking at the one in supplementary record volume two at page 170, paragraph 76 and 77. <clears throat> the SCA in effect finds that the High Court was wrong in rejecting the mother's evidence as supported by Professor Berg and uh, also find that it's clear from Professor Berg's report that uh, the mechanisms put in place in the UK are not sufficient to mitigate any of the risks. Um, is there any discretion exercised by the High Court and did the SCA correctly interfere with that discretion if so? Uh, Justice Majit, we would say that the High Court did not exercise a discretion. What the High Court did was apply the 13B test to the facts of the matter. And the, the manner in which one assesses whether or not there is a, uh, a grave risk of, of, of harm or an intolerable situation, that the steps and the considerations are set out very clearly in case law. And that it is only once it is assessed that there is that grave risk or that the child may be placed in an intolerable situation that the court can then exercise a discretion in regard to uh, whether or not the child would be sent back. In this case, Mr. Justice Saldana concluded that there was no Article 13b defense and therefore no discretion was exercised and the child was sent back, his order was the child should be sent back to the, to the, the UK. So, so we say that the SCA did not interfere with a, with a discretion exercised by, by the High Court. If, uh, if that is the case, uh, then it means, as the Chief Justice, I think, said earlier, the SCA was at large to interfere with those findings. And so would this court be in theory, unless it is a, simply an appeal on the facts? And I've got your submissions that you say it is, in fact, an appeal on the facts of the application of, a, of an established legal test. Am I correct there? That is correct, Justice Majid. Yes, then one last question. Again, the one that I asked earlier of Ms. Mayossi is the question of owners. What kind of owners does a defense of Article 13 be attract in this instance in your clients? 
is it the normal uh, balance of probabilities or what is it? Is it more stringent or what is it? Justice Madrid, it is the, the balance, the only this balance of, of probabilities. And to the extent I think that there was a, a, a question which you raised earlier of whether it should be on any other standard. I think that what the case law talks about in respect of Article 13b and whether or not it needs to be uh, narrowly construed and interpreted is that what has been said in, in case law is that Article 13b is already strict. It is already narrow and does not need to be interpreted any more narrowly than it is in, on a basis of a plain reading of those words. So we would certainly say it's balance of probabilities. It is already a very narrow and stringent test. Thank you. Yes, th thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Chief Justice, uh, uh, yes. sorry, can I just ask a question following upon what um, Justice Majid asked the um, yes. ask counsel? Um, the, having overturned the finding of the High Court that the, there was no evidence or that uh, there was no grave risk as envisaged in Article 13, and having found that such a grave risk does exist, do you accept that the High Court then had to exercise a discretion whether or not to return the child? No, once uh, um, Justice Fonzell, once once the court finds that there is no defence, then I'm unless I'm referring to the the finding of the SCA, the SCA yes, found certainly. that there was a risk. Having yes. found that, do you accept that it then had to exercise a discretion whether or not to return Emily? Of course, yes, Justice Fonzell, that would okay. be correct. And is there, is there anything in the judgment of the SCA that indicates an appreciation of the existence of a discretion and the exercise thereof? I would suggest that there is in the fact that a, the grave risk that she would face could not be ameliorated by any safe harbour orders or undertakings. And for such reason, a return order was not made. Is that the only consideration when you exercise the discretion? Well, it would be whether, if the finding is on the facts that the child will face a grave risk of harm or otherwise be placed in an intolerable situation, the next inquiry can only be, do we then place her in that intolerable situation and exercise a discretion to ignore the fact that she will be harmed. Alternatively, we look at, is there any way to ameliorate that harm? Those would be the only considerations I would submit that a court could consider. Thank you. What, what do you say to the proposition that Mr. Paul finds himself in a very disadvantaged position because now you say, and uh, some of the experts say, if Emily is returned to him, uh, she will be returned to a stranger. But it is not the situation in which he finds himself, as I read the record, is not of his own making, namely the absence of, of a better relationship between the two of them is not because of, is not of his own making. Uh, Emily has a good relationship with her aunt because her aunt has got all the opportunity with her. She lives with her. So she's the only person that uh, uh, she knows as, uh, you know, uh, the caregiver. 
he doesn't know the father to be the caregiver because when she left the UK to come to South Africa, she was too small. And uh, we, we don't know if Emily had been left in the UK when her mother came to South Africa, maybe Mr. Ball and Emily would have had, would be having a wonderful relationship. Is it fair to, pay to, to say, Mr. Ball, Emily shouldn't return to use that to say she, she should not return to the UK because she'll be returning to a stranger? Is it fair in these circumstances? This is, this is, this is Emily's biological father. Chief Justice, in the circumstances of a Hague Convention application, which is a jurisdictional determination and which looks at the grave risk of harm to the child, then with respect, yes, it is fair to say that Emily should not be returned to her father. And again, one has to look at the potential harm that they could have been and could be in her relationship with her father if she was returned in those circumstances. Is it a situation of Mr. Ball's own making? No, to the extent that he, he was deprived of a relationship of, with his child for a period of time. Emily is older now she will have a better memory and an ability between contact visits, et cetera, to remember and know who he is. At the time, and it was the timing and the age of the child which was unfortunate for him. But again, in, this is a, if we are dealing with the convention proceedings, one cannot say that Mr. Ball's right and because he was prejudiced, that he must suffer no prejudice, and therefore Emily should suffer an, an, an intolerable situation, because that is what one is weighing up. If one is weighing up that Mr. Ball deserves to have his child with him, and the decision is, we are going to find that Mr. Ball deserves to have his child with him, then the consequence of that decision in terms of Hague, is that we will then place Emily in his care, despite the fact that there is a grave risk of harm to her. And we will just hope that it all works out, despite expert evidence, which suggests very much to the contrary. But the, 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 the harm is not harm that will be visited upon Emily by her father. The harm, as I understand the position, simply arises from the fact that uh, she has spent the amount of time that she has spent away from him and in South Africa, away from the UK. If the environment that she will be returned to if she were to be returned to the UK. Is the same environment under which she would have been raised if her mother didn't have to come to South Africa and didn't pass on and she continued to stay in the UK. It's the same environment she would have, she would have been raised uh, under, isn't it? The only difference is, and you must tell me if my reading or understanding of the record is correct, is not correct. My understanding is a lot is placed on the fact that uh, Emily hasn't doesn't have a relationship with her father. She will be coming to a stranger. You mentioned it too. You mentioned that in your address, the home. She won't have a recollection of the home, or it's a different home. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, she left at the age of under two or around two years. 
I, 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 I don't think that uh, uh, she would have at that stage had any much of a recollection of, of that home. So I'm trying to put the court in the, in the shoes of this biological parent who has been deprived of the opportunity to have a relationship, uh, a proper relationship with uh, this child, with his child, uh, who has been trying and wants the child back. The report that uh, was referred to of what his uh, employer says about him seems good. Mr. Ninji Onjini's uh, report is also good. Um, and when I look at um, Ms. Kasten's report, it's also good, but, and you can deal with that later in the written submissions, but she seems to have uh, either had no conversation or very little conversation with Mr. Ball, and uh, uh, so I asked myself the question, is this a situation where a parent is being denied the opportunity to have the child return and raise his own child simply because uh, of a situation beyond his control? Because you concede that it's not because of what he has done. It's not of his own making. So I, I continue to be troubled by that situation. And maybe I should also add this, so when you respond, you can deal with all of it. Uh, it does not appear from what I've read that Mr. Paul is somebody of great means. Uh, uh, I think the current employer uh, or as at the time of the SCA or whatever time, I'm not sure, said he, I think he drives his delivery van to customers or whatever. Um, uh, and it may well be that from the side of Emily's aunt, you know, the position is much better, maybe. Uh, but this is uh, the biological father of, of Emily. And if really he has done nothing uh, seriously wrong, one would have thought that uh, the importance of ensuring that there is a relationship between the child and the biological father remaining by a parent uh, is factored into everything. Uh, it may be that if, if I'm a poor person, and um, maybe poor is not the right word, but if the child is taken somewhere and there she is seen to enjoy a better life, um, the tendency might be to say she must stay there, you know. But uh, one doesn't want to uh, have a situation where if you are poor, then you are thought not to be able, not to be deserving of having a proper relationship with your child. Justice Zondi, I'd like to Zondo. Zondo, I, sorry, I, I apologize. I'm getting confused. Uh, Chief Justice, I don't think there is any suggestion that Emily should be deprived of having a relationship with her father or vice versa, or that he, because he um, may not be in a financially very strong position, should not be able to care for his child. I again suggest that that the the considerations that would be that are would be before a, a convention court versus a court dealing with parental rights and responsibilities are very different 
Yes, you, you made the point earlier. If we, firstly, in regard to the, um, the employer of Mr. Ball at the time, and as was pointed out in the papers, he had been employed for approximately six weeks at most with a history of unemployment. So his, the, the comment in regard to his, his person and his habits was based on knowing him for a period of six weeks where there was a history as set out in social services report of a number of challenges which Mr. Ball faced. But again, that was not the primary basis of the 13.1b defense. And we say that if a parent, for whatever reason, has not seen their child for 15 months since the child was two years old and two months, and there was a report saying the child no longer knows you and has no memory of where she lived and other people, that that parent would not expect the child to be placed in their care without more ado, because they would recognize the harm that would take place and the impact, the negative impact on that child. And that is, that, that is the crux. It is a, a very unfortunate consequence for Mr. Ball, but it is not, it is certainly not on, on, in terms of the, the convention hearing, weighing up of, of Ms. Koch versus Mr. Ball. It is a consideration of Emily and whether or not she will face an intolerable situation pending the outcome of custody or parental rights and responsibilities, a, a parental rights and responsibilities hearing. That has, that has landed up on the back burner for a considerable period of time and has of course contributed to the problem. But, and, and, and certainly that's not of Mr. Ball's making, it's also not of Emily's making. And to be fair to the respondent, in circumstances where she feels that it is fair and reasonable and in Emily's interests for a court to look at and determine what is in Emily's long-term interest, she can't be faulted either. And it is an unfortunate uh, consequence of litigation that has meant that Emily, who is the center of this, has lost a mother. That's certainly not in her interest and a trauma she will deal with for a long time. That she hasn't got a relationship with her father. And, and the report of Ms. Carstens, which I know we will deal with in submissions, is silent on A, his circumstances, and B, the efforts that he has made to be involved in Emily's life. So we, we don't know those things. And, and while we are concerned for Mr. Ball, the court dealing, we say, with the custody application will be able to assess the attempts that Mr. Ball has made to be involved in his child's life, to have a relationship with his child. We don't know what that situation is. Thank, thank you very much. You, I don't Justice. think... Yes, Can I, I ask think... one last question, three, please? Yes. Chief Justice. Yes. So am I understanding you correctly that in a con, con, um, in this type of hearing, um, the reflection of time is actually the paramount principle. You said anything else is irrelevant. We, we have a child of this age, so it's difficult to have contact with a child of this age and because of the distance. That would always mean that there can be no relationship and therefore it will always be intolerable. So the court won't look at anything else and there won't really be any exercise of a discretion of Plask and Evans or any of that. 
No, no, Justice Potrell, I, I apologize if I've, if I've misled you in any way. What I referred to was the circumstances of this particular matter where the father had not seen the child from age two and uh, four months and for a period of 15 months. At that age, at that age, a 15 month gap where he did not see her, that would cause a considerable disruption and a child of that age, as is set out in the reports, cannot remember a parent over that period of time. And Professor Berg refers to Zoom contact and the reason why for a child of that age, they cannot sustain that relationship. So if, for example, Mr. Ball had come to South Africa during that period of time, um, every three months and visited, what would happen in the Hague Convention, the outcome might be very different. It is, but those are the particular facts of the particular matter and the age of that child. If when, when he had left, Emily had been six or seven, there would be a very different consideration depending on the relationship that they had because she would have been able to sustain a relationship over a period of time. But those are the facts in this particular matter. Which yes, one I is specifically there. said this, this age and, and the, this specific distance. I didn't make it relevant to the child of six, for instance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are any further indications from colleagues uh, in that event. Thank you very much, uh, Council. We will now move to the applicants' council for the reply. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, Chief Justice. Thank um, you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to address what one thing, which is really the concerns um, expressed by yourself regarding um, the, the, the father who, who through no fault of his own, um, hasn't seen his child for so long and, and for whom it means he now must not have a relationship. Miss, Miss McCurdy stated that the focus was never a comparison on the papers as to which um, parent, which one is, is a better parent uh, comparing them. But th that was very much the, the, the narrative. I, I just wanted to point out with reference to the papers, uh, Miss um, Koch's assertions that in the event that Claire dies, she believes that she will have a happier and better quality of life if she remains in my care. We have a strong bond. I'm stable, healthy, consistent, and can provide for her financially. She explains that she built her home in Northrop. She has two cars. She has additional investments in property and shares and so on. So with reference to your question, Chief Justice, about the means, the relative means, and whether it is fair for someone because perhaps they have not as much as another to lose the relationship with their child. This was certainly an aspect of the second leg of the Article 13, 13B um, defense. Um, the, the, the father, Mr. Ball, has repeatedly pointed out in the papers that, in fact, his efforts to make contact with Emily in the circumstances were often rebuffed or frustrated. Um, he would have to, he would ask for Zoom contact or Skype, and he would be told, we're going to consult about it. Uh, we don't want to confuse her. So he's, he's, he, the, the papers are full of those references that the, the, he, it was very difficult for him, even though he asserted uh, his interest in, in, in getting hold or in, in talking to his child. Um, and, and of course, it was not ideal. I think it's common cause that manner of um, contacting a child that young with concentration spans and everything. It was not ideal, but he did 
uh, pursue it in any event. It, it is, I would, I submit, uh, Chief Justice, that it's, it is fair to place, unfair to place a burden of like this on Mr. Ball to be told uh, if he was coming to South Africa every three months, it, it it really is unfair, even with all the circumstances, and and it also loses sight of the fact that this was this was the period during COVID, during lockdowns, people couldn't get on planes and come and see others across the world, and 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 it was really a confluence of very unfortunate circumstances that have now led to uh, what Justice Pot Potrell alluded to as this time factor being an overriding. Um, factor that deprives him of of continued continued relationships with of, of establishing re-establishing a relationship with his daughter. I also just wanted to remind you, Chief Justice, you you said um, you would give us an opportunity to address the report of Miss Carstens in writing, but I, I think you hadn't gotten to listing exactly for us what aspects you wanted us to address. So I wanted to remind you of, of that. CJ, you, you need you, to unmute, you... unmute, CJ. Yeah, I must keep myself unmuted, I'm sorry. Do you, yes. do you, do you, do you, uh, do you Miss Mercy, do you want to finish your address and then I'll deal with that? Yes, um, and just to, to to perhaps address a question that um, Justice Rogers asked about the Plascon Evans rule and the nature of of these proceedings, the, uh, the the Hague Convention speaks repeatedly in various articles, Article Eleven, about moving with, with expedition. There's even an Article Fourteen which says, um, which describes the manner in which. Um, evidence that is placed before a court may be taken as being the law without without additional proof. So everything around the structure of it lends itself to um, quick consideration or ex expeditious consideration. Just by, by way of example, there's even a practice directive in the Western Cape High Court to the effect that once proceedings are launched, they must be completed within a period of six weeks. So. I, I think the difficulties of proceeding along the Plascon Evans route uh, would uh, perhaps given up uh, uh, because of expedition and 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 doing things as quickly as possible. It never does turn out that way, but I think that would be the rationale. And I have I don't have any further uh, submissions and comments, Chief Justice. Okay. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Maybe I should just put this to you and it flows it uh, flows from questions that uh, my colleague justice Rogers put to counsel for the respondents in relation to plascon events you know plascon events allows a possibility that a dispute could be decided on the basis of a false version as long as the version is not far-fetched <laughs> that is now the respondent's version but the applicant it is said can't complain because the applicant in such pro in motion proceedings or post motion proceedings would have had an opportunity to apply for the matter to be referred to oral evidence and would have elected not to do that. So he or she can't complain if uh, the matter is decided on a version that is not true. But now if the, if, uh, the Hague Convention proceedings emphasize expedition and then he, they are decided on the basis of PlusCon events. Uh, doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of expedition? Because if you are going to say we'll use 
the respondent's version. Uh, you have to say we use the respondent's version because you have elected that you don't want the matter to go to oral evidence, but actually because it's hate convention proceedings, you don't want to go to oral evidence. Therefore, isn't the position that it would be better to say no, 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 either no plus con events and the court must do the best it can with what it has to arrive at a, 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 a decision on what's in the interest of the child. Or you say, well, if PASCON events has to be used, it must be used as a last resort. The court should, to some extent, conduct this as an inquiry. What, what do you say to that? To conduct it as a, an inquiry would suggest a fact-finding exercise, more of a fact-finding exercise and less of an adversarial process. So I, th I think put it this way, leave it with how it is, but where the court thinks that um, I, I don't have enough information and it would be <laughs> in the interest of these types of proceedings to ask for certain information to be made available, then it could do that. Yes. Chief Justice, I think that's probably a more effective response. In other words, what um, Justice Fanseo suggested uh, ought to be the stance of a court by taking more of an active role. And um, if I recall, I think that was the, the stance that was taken by Justice Saldana in the Western Cape High Court where he told the parties what it is that's missing, what it is that he needs. Um, he tended to adopt the view, there's no necessity for people to be obtaining report after report after report, because it's not that kind of, uh, of, of, of proceeding here. Uh, reports will be necessary at a later stage in the country of, 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 of habitual residence. Mm -hmm. So it, it definitely is a more, a productive stance to 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 adopt for a court to take a more active role as did uh, Justin Sadana in 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 that matter because Plascon Evers would also be made difficult no 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 the resort to oral evidence would also be made difficult chief justice you mustn't forget by the fact that one of the parties is 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 overseas mm. not in the country mm. Mm. Um, and that could make that unworkable for that reason. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, with regard to uh, Ms. Custom's report, the idea was not necessarily that I would, uh, or we would say to the parties, this is what you we want you to deal with. We would uh, leave it to you to submit what your response or comments on it. Uh, what would remain is simply uh, or, or what you make of it or what we should make of it, your, what your submissions are as to what we should make of that report. What would remain is uh, fixing deadlines uh, so that uh, everyone knows by when they must uh, submit their supplementary revision submissions. Um, uh, Seven days for the applicants. Is that, is that is that fair? Is that fine? Seven calendar days. Yes, Chief Justice, we can work with that. Okay. Uh, the respondent uh, five calendar days after the, after they have submitted theirs. Certainly, Chief Justice. Is that fine. I'm just that that takes us to a, a weekday. Uh, yeah, but. Just remember, I said calendar days so that there's no confusion about calendar or court days. Calendar days, seven for the applicant and five for the respondent. That is five after the applicant has served, uh, filed and served her, their written uh, submissions. That five days would be a Sunday, Chief Justice, so I presume it would then be the Monday. Of it's course, you can, always, you can always file on, on Friday before the Sunday. We can try to do that. <laughs> but we will give you up to Monday then, up to Monday. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I, I take it colleagues are fine with that. Uh, okay, I think we...
have come to the end um, of the proceedings. Uh, I don't think there was any colleague who still had any question. Uh, we are going to reserve judgment. We thank counsel on both sides for their submissions. As soon as judgment is ready, the parties will be notified. Judgment is reserved and the court adjourns. As the court is Today's proceedings have concluded. The host will now terminate the